Ryan Arcover at DBL. I'm with Oakland County Animal Care. I also work in private practice in addition to the show. I love them both. Love them the minuses. Two different hats for sure. Bring hat on during the day and my days off when I come to the shelter. I just bring hat around and get into a different mindset. Um, my fortune is not here staying there with both loads of money to give us to take care of the animals. So we have to be a little bit more creative and uh, prioritize a little bit differently. Um, first of all, I guess I'm just kind of wondering who I'm speaking to here. How many are shelter volunteers? Okay. How many veterinary technicians or assistants? How many veterinarians? Shelter managers? Okay. Yeah, I see hands go up a few times, so you guys also wear five, six hats, I see. Wonderful. Okay, we've only got an hour to talk, so I can scratch the surface on a lot of different things. We can't go heavily into depth on any of them. Um, it is not on there. I put it on my sheet here. I didn't link it to the slide, so I guess we're on protection. But if you want my email address, you can copy it down. If you have any questions that we don't address here or clarification, feel free to email me. It is B as in boy, R, C, in Mexico, which will mention, at ACT.net. I got that from Spain, neutering dog, a cat in Mexico. I need an account, and I just kept it, and now I live by curious that way all the time. <laughs> so I keep it, you know, close as I've gotten in a while. Just see if there's a burning question you want to ask it while we're going along, not a problem, keep your hand up. Yeah, I'll throw something at me, whatever. Otherwise, at the end, hopefully we'll come up with a little bit of time. I'm unfortunately not going to be able to participate in our table discussions later. I think I had a prior commitment that I need to take care of. Okay, our objective. Um, as, as written in the brochure here, we're going to try to maintain healthy animals. We have to deal with the management of, in, of the illnesses in the shelter. Um, return them to health as quickly as we can without spreading it to every animal in the shelter. Um, financial considerations for sure, humane considerations. And then uh, something I thought that was important enough to put in my opening slide here is avoidance of a disaster necessitating the population, which we might lose sight of when we don't see it a whole lot, but we read about them. Um, you know, we just think we're trying to keep the common cold under control. But nowadays we do have the threat of canine influenza, something to that extent could, re could require drastic measures. Um, the on pan leukopenia outbreak that's happened left in Saginaw area not too long ago. So we do still see these, and that is just such a, such a deflation and such, such a nightmare. We want to avoid that. So our, our, our daily stuff, hand washing. I mean, just the simplest thing, so you might just think we're trying to keep the, the battle of feline upper respiratory down. Well, we are, but we also have to avoid that, uh, that nightmare. <laughs> Maintaining our healthy animals. Two, two, two schools that we're having to deal with here. One, one, we've got the incoming animals that may appear healthy, may not appear healthy, um, under a great deal of stress, so that's an obstacle for us mm -hmm. as far as maintaining their health. Um, versus the established residents, the ones who've been hanging out. We kind of have an advantage. We know what their history is. We know what they're coming to us with. Um, hopefully we have some records that can kind of tell us what they've been through. Um, and so the big the big thing with the established residents is keeping the illness away from them. Obviously the cat or dog that sneezes and coughs, and that's a piece of cake. But these incoming ones can simply present a challenge because we don't know what kind of baggage thing they have. They can all carry some of these pathogens in their respiratory system, and we aren't going to know it. Um, they can carry dermatoses skin issues, ringworms, things like that, uh, ringworm, and uh, we may not know it. They could be an asymptomatic carrier. So even though the ones coming in uh, appear healthy and look healthy to us, we still need to take it with a grain of salt and treat everything with the utmost, um, you know, biosecurity, if you will. Okay, which one's <laughs> <laughs> Again, we're perfectly healthy and happy, but who knows what's in that nose, the mouth, the ears, um, the fur, that we'd be carrying something. Um, the initial assessment, very critical. Uh, we're looking at that current health versus the risk of acquiring illness. That perfectly healthy animal we're looking at, is it a puppy or a kitten? Um, and is, it, is it vaccinated, is it unvaccinated? Did it nurse well, did it not nurse well? There's so many things that we really don't know. And that kind of ties our hands from a medical standpoint. So we generally just kind of need to assume the worst. If it's a Persian or Himalayan and it's under seven weeks, it has ringworm. I don't care if you see it or know it, just assume it doesn't handle it that way, and then we won't have uh, an outbreak to deal with. 
Can I ask um, a question here, Cassandra? You, you sure can. Yeah. Well, we did have the problem with Ringworm, mm -hmm. and we isolated it to one cat, although eight did come down with it. Mm -hmm. She was considered a mechanical failure. We could find no evidence in it. How do we, as, as a rescue when they're coming in, you know, we, we can blacklight them, but if does that, that didn't show up in a black-white situation. So what That's super reliable because of the, the false negative. So what would we do just, I mean, is there some way to I can't say what I want to say. Is there some way to really assess it as they're coming in? Not really, other specific? than, like I said, be real suspicious of a long-haired cat. Okay. The version of Himalayans have an infinity for okay. the but younger, you would probably see the more susceptible. Range. You can, but in the real young ones, you may not. Because okay. you do have those asymptomatic carriers. So there's times you just, you're not going to be able to, to assess that and know that. So just okay. essentially treat them all like they have it. Okay. Um, obviously, yeah, if you get the hairless lesion, any alopecia sure. anywhere, especially head, muzzle, ears, for sure. Have a great black light. Have the right kind of black light. Know how to use it. Give it the five, ten minute warm up. Make sure it's got the right frequency. Some people just go by their little ultraviolet light. You know, at Sam's Club and think that's going to do it. You're going to have even more false positives in that way. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. One thing our, um, that, that helps us is suggested when we bring in new cancers to lime sulfur, dip all of them. <laughs> Which, yeah, that's not okay. fun. Uh, but, but uh, you know, probably the, the biggest thing you're going to see and hear me harp on today is stress, 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 stress yeah. management. And you're taking a cat that's coming in and immediately putting on a yeah. great deal of stress. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the safety and health issue and then the human exposure. But I could see someone who's been burned doing that for sure. I do that too. I have a problem all of a sudden it's holy smoke, you know. So you, you got to be careful about the knee-jerk reactions there. But yeah, that's definitely one thing. Like I said, I just kind of look at guys and go with my level of suspicion. And from time to time, we're going to get burned. But hopefully, with, again, proper biosecurity handling of these animals and the spot cleaning that, um, was it Tanya? Yeah. Yeah, the spot cleaning she talked about. All these types of things are going to lessen our chances of getting burned and lessen our chances of having a full blown outbreak of something somewhere because we're mixing cats with dogs and doing all that. Yeah. What is spot cleaning? Spot yeah. cleaning is, you know, and, and we were guilty of it too, uh, in, in the recent past year, we just move an animal from one cage to the next, take it out, wash it, dry it, do whatever, but someone's handled that cat, put it in a new cage that may or may not have been cleaned well and properly, which is an art in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So instead of that, we're gonna go in and change the litter box or scoop litter. If you can, if you see any visible debris, organic debris, poop, you can clean that off the cage, any sneeze type marks. So you're just going to clean the spots that appear dirty to you. Are we missing some germs and things like that? Yeah, but they belong to that cat. That cat's dealing with them, so we're going to let it go. When that cat's adopted out or once a week, once every 10 days, or whenever you decide, okay, cages have to be clean type of deal. Um, if you minimize that movement, you're going to minimize the chance of moving things like ringworm. They just had the cat or kitten that wasn't showing signs in and out. Because of, uh, most people's sanitation procedures out of necessity aren't, aren't adequate. You know, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But again, uh, I don't think any of us uh, are able to be anal enough with that cleaning procedure when we're on the time, the resources, and sometimes the knowledge. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of pitfalls with that. Um, again, in that initial assessment, we have to decide on vaccinations and routine care. Vaccinations are great, the sooner the better, even a matter of hours. You know, two, three hours, four hours earlier than you normally would instead of at the end of the day can make a difference between getting an animal a baseline and really going, at least starting the battle. So if it does pick up one of these diseases, it's going to be less severe, less shedding potential, things like that. The routine care, are we going to harbor test, feline leukemia and AIDS test? Are we going to do a fecal? Are we just going to deworm? I mean, these are all decisions that need to be made, you know, based upon that. And again, I'm not going to give you exact recipe saying this is what you do with the dog and cat when it comes in, because we definitely don't have time. I'm just, and I'm guilty of it too, there's so much, you know, I don't know what I don't know. So this is just to kind of give you things to think about, jot down some notes, say yes, I need to look into this or that. You can Google stuff, you can go online, and there's some other great sites and resources that will probably tell you exactly what you should do for your situation. Every situation is going to be a little bit different. And you'll see another website in there that if you aren't familiar with it, it's um, www.sheltermedicine.com. That's where most of my talk is coming from. That's um, UC Davis with Dr. Hurley. She is the guru of all things shelter health and medicine. So if you want to know something, she'll, and if she doesn't have it on the site, she's going to tell you where to go for sanitation issues and cleaning and how you should do stuff. What was um, that website again? Stuff. It's www.sheltermedicine.com. Yep, and you'll find anything and everything you need on their great site. So this, this is the kind of things we're thinking about during this initial assessment. 
Uh, movement in shelter traffic flow is also huge, very important. You, you don't want animals that have just come in and are just stressed right now um, next to your kittens. You don't want them right next to the door where there's going to be continued traffic and stress and things like that. Um, since we don't know about them, we don't want them right next to the cleaners area where they're cleaning food bowls and litter boxes and things like that because of aerosol transmission and whatnot. So, um, you know, when you're thinking of movement in, in shelter traffic, well, you have to figure out where am I going to put my healthy animals, where am I going to put my sick animals, are they going to have to cross each other, are they going to be too close to each other, um, where do we put the kittens, which we'll call naive, that they're open for all sorts of infections, um, where are the barking dogs, where are we doing surgery at? You know, where's the heavy traffic areas and people poking and prodding at things? Um, where's the washing machine and the dryer playing and banging away? You're not going to put your tinted cats right next to that, I hope, or the dog that's already on the verge of being a fear biter. Put him next to there, and he's for sure going to, you know, be on the euthanasia list for being aggressive. So we, we can kind of think about these things. And again, I can tell you exactly where to put things. It's just a lot of times in our day to day busyness taking in and doing what we have to do and trying to get done. We don't really stop and think, what is our traffic flow here? We were guilty of that at Oakland County Shelter. You know, we've been going along, and after three years, we're like, yeah, that's really stupid. Why are we doing that? We never thought about it. It was one of those things we didn't know that we didn't know. But when you think about it, yeah, wow, if we can take all these little bites out and save 5%, 10% here and there on illness, when you add all that together, we're going to be in a lot better shape. So definitely, you know, take a look at movement shelter. Um, you know, make a, make a little map of your place. You know, like we have the map of, of this place and where, where the rooms are. Make, you know, look at your traffic flow and try and not. Yep. Where did the green animal go to a quarantine area? Um, do you have a suggested period of time for this That's tough. That's tough. And anywhere generally reasonable, I would say two to seven days. You really don't want to go any longer than seven days, even though there's some things that they could have that can cause a problem, but you don't want them out of the adoption pool for much longer than that. Um, some things will pop up right away. You know, within two days, you're going to start to see some herpes and some other issues. Um, so it depends how quick you want them out, you know, how, how old they are. Are they old or sick or are they very young? Because all that's going to play, play into it. But um, again, it's, it's going to be variable, but I think it's a great idea. In a lot of places, you know, some are able to do it, some aren't, and it depends on, um, you know, do you have hold times and things like that. The straight is broad and you have to hold it for five days. That's a great time to have them in a quarantine room and have them in full exposure and stresses for them. So that's not that's not a bad plan. But when someone just comes in and doesn't give them my animal, what do you do with that one? Same thing, you interview the owner real well, find out hopefully as much honest information as you can about it so that you can make that risk assessment on it and decide this thing can go up right now. You know, if, if it's the outdoor cat or indoor outdoor cat, then, you know, you have no idea. If it's the indoor cat strictly, okay, you're, you're pretty safe probably put it up for an adoption as long as it's looking healthy. So again, it'll be a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you need to pay attention for sure for all the personnel involved, who's handling the animals, are they trained, are they not trained, are they on the same page, um, are they changing all the time. A lot of people can, uh, you know, kind of like the uh, the game where you tell someone the, the, the secret and you pass it around and it becomes something else. So make sure we have the same central training program going on. Everyone's on that same page and doing things the same way. Otherwise, one or two people handling it, not following the rules, can really undermine everything. It doesn't take long at all to find out for half a day they've been moving cats around. And, you know, you know like where the animals are, and all of a sudden, boom, you know, you've been great for 10 days, and all of a sudden, one day can blow everything up on you. So, so make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, documenting training is great. You know, it's really good to have it documented because sometimes, again, we just don't realize if someone hasn't had this training or that training or, you know, they don't understand something. They read something online all by themselves and took off with it. So those are other things that to pay attention to. Um, the quarantine thing that you just discussed. Yeah, yeah, do we quarantine? Do we not quarantine? Where do we quarantine? Again, is this in the back room behind the washer and dryer? you know, where we're going to bring about things. Okay, good and bad. They have herpes, which they probably do. You're going to know it in a short amount of time because of the stress. So again, how do we do it? Um, who does it? The personnel, again, uh, are they good at handling them or are they go in and play with these poor, lonely animals that, you know, aren't getting attention and they go about doing their rounds of treating all your healthy animals. So again, there's so many little things to, to, to do. We need so much help. We need so many volunteers. Um, but yet the smaller number of people handling certain animals is great. So, so trying to dedicate and keep them dedicated to that. They might have a favorite cat that went to a different room. You know, we don't want them doing a whole lot of visiting or going in between 
So yeah, like we said, the quarantine period is going to be variable. And, and, and it's that way for diseases too, depending on what disease you look at. It'll say two to five days, seven to 14 days. I mean, it just really depends. Stress management. Of course, he can. this is a relatively new arrival in the middle of a busy hallway in this cage, and he does not look happy to me. Um, <laughs> you know, that, we didn't have to do anything. That's just the way he was. He probably sat there for six hours, you know, that way. So, uh, yeah, not, not ideal for him. It's, you know, it's going to bring up some unwanted behavior and possibly land him on a euthanasia list when it may not be necessary if he's given a nicer, quieter place to hang out. And uh, as well as if he does that, which again, he probably does, um, it's going to bring it about a lot quicker in this type of the situation and, and land in a bike quarantine or something along those lines. So we really need to pay attention to stress management, as well as the dog. When, when the dog comes in, is, is this guy barking his head off, or is he very timid? Are we going to put him next to the dog who's barking his head off, or no when it comes in? So the stress management, um, just as important for dogs, but uh, you know, for, for cats, we think of it first. It's going to bring about more adverse behavior, for sure. Sanitation. Wash your hands. Fantastic. You can do a lot all day long. Um, soap and water, warm water, 20, 30 seconds. Make sure people know we're not just sticking our hands under water and whatnot. Um, the the handy hand gels and whatnot, a good idea. Um, definitely not 100% by any stretch. And make sure people are aware of that so they don't get a false sense of security and think that they can play with their cat put some alcohol on and run to the next cat. That's not, not going to succeed. You know, I had experience just briefly with the sanitation. On the hand sanitizer, mm -hmm. it seemed like the cat reacted, well, actually, I'm just warm with a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't like that on my hand. Even after it had dried or whatever, I had to wash, rinse it off and everything. The hand sanitizer. Yeah, the, the, the perfumes and whatnot. But again, if we're handling the cats the least amount possible, then yeah, you know, that's okay. But again, we'll, we'll get into the whole socialization thing where we do some human contact and whatnot. Um, but they probably have the, the, the non, you know, fragrant or aromatic type ones. But yeah, definitely they're not going to be real big fans of that. Mm -hmm. um, we'll go into the other sanitation aspects a little bit later for cleaning, cleaning agents and all that good stuff. I guess I can talk for three hours just on sanitation. <laughs> you don't want to be laughing here, but no, <laughs> but we can get to Okay, records are uh, critical every step of the way, and we're guilty of not being on at our shelter, of not being where we need to be with records for sure. Um, and, and, and in light of this, the, the incoming animals, um, we need to get a baseline going. We, we've got to get something jotted down, the initial PE. Um, our thoughts, what, what do we think risks are? What do we think problems are with this animal? So we have to get all that documented. And then uh, it's got to either be in a central location or even following the animal in some sort of a, you know, a packet that, that goes with them, hopefully waterproof. Um, but records are <coughs> critical. It doesn't matter. You don't have to write a ton. It doesn't have, you know, we're not looking for volume here. We're definitely looking for qual quality more than quantity. It really helps us out, especially our shelter has four veterinarians that pop in and out, so the continuity isn't there. The only way that we can any continuity is if something is written down and we have an idea what's going on. Established residence. That's a spelling error there, but I guess it works. <laughs> Hopefully not, that we don't want this to be their residence. But, uh, they are resident. <laughs> but good puppy looking for a home. Um, this is just in lieu of the whole maintaining healthy animals. We just did the incoming animals, now we've got the established animals. And, and so you're going to see some of the same bullets coming up here. Um, scheduled assessments, that's the one thing that's different. Um, for sure we need a schedule. We have to have something we're looking at as far as when are we going to recheck these animals. So they can come in and we're not going to look at it again for three weeks. Did it have a sore on a top that needs to be looked at and isn't going to get looked at? Were we suspicious of an alopecia, a hair loss region on it that could be something and needs to be followed up? Um, so schedule assessments are great. Um, again, I'm not going to tell you how to do it. We don't have the great thing. We've got sticky notes here and there. We've got a dry erase board, so it, it's a work in progress. Um, I'm the expert here today, but <laughs> we've got a lot of work to do as well. And, and again, it's, you know, I don't know what I don't know, so we're working on it. Anything you can come up with, the dry erase calendar boards, whatever. You can have them by zone. You can have one sent per place. If it's computerized records, great, but someone needs to be printing off a sheet and looking at something. So every 7, 10, 14 days, we're printing off a list for someone that needs to be checked. Ideally, yeah, the animals should look at it in a days. You don't want someone coming through your shelter saying, I you know the dog hemorrhaging in case you don't know. <laughs> you know, so we need to be on top of that, you know, so yes, we're, we're dealing with it. We have a vaccine calendar 
and it is for everything. It's not just for vaccines, but yeah. it just yeah. goes along and, and you know, there's two people that are responsible for it. That's great. And we check them every day. And, That's yeah. great. Yeah, color coding things, vaccines versus vehicle versus problems. So we do patients. We yeah. always are staying with the patients are checked every day for That's the great. week, you know. That's great. Yeah, we've got some people that they have it, but they don't use it. They don't have the manpower at the time. So again, it's when you're designing this, we've got to be workable. We've got to be yeah. something we can do. I was just going to offer, we also have a sheet on the door of the vet room so that any volunteer or anybody who notices anything about an animal can just jot it down, what mm -hmm. location you're in, what date, and your name, and then they'll follow up. Great. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Keep the pen in the hands of the right people, though. Lucky look really cute today. Thank you, but you're clogging up. <laughs> yeah, but no, that's a good idea, and definitely things will be missed. The more eyes we have to look at things, the more observation. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Someone might spend one minute looking at an animals, someone else can spend ten minutes to right. see different things. You know, that's, that's a great idea. Vaccinations is routine care. I've seen that guy before. Um, <laughs> Good position, we put someone else in harm's way. <laughs> 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 we know what we're doing there. Um, and again, very important for the established residents. We talked about it already briefly with the incoming animals as far as what to do and what not to do. We may have foregone a vaccine or two because we were worried about the animal when it came in. Well, hopefully it's on our schedule and we're going to revisit that. Or it's an animal that may need a booster that we're going to go ahead and booster for it. Um, so we, again, we got to stay on top of that. The routine care, um, at that point, we might do some other stuff. We might have to have a fecal to recheck. Again, we might have that hair loss leads that we want to recheck and at that. The skin scraping might be coming back with results, all that good stuff. So the established residents, very hard to not drop the ball on them and find that we've had an animal for 21 days and it has a bad fecal or something, and all of a sudden it's got diarrhea. Well, how much of that is it spread out in the common areas in the yards? So again, we need to really stand. We're, but unfortunately, we're still busy a lot of times with the incoming, that we aren't able to take care of that established residence. Sometimes I hit the door and I do nothing but stand at the surgery table for six hours, and then you know I go home. Someone's like, "Do you have any pugs in there?" I don't know. All I saw was surgery animals. You know, I, I wish I was able to walk through and see and look at these. Um, but that's something else that this would do. You look at the schedule, you grab the doctors, they come on. We're going. We got something to do. The personnel, again, with the established care, we talked about it in extra eyes, looking at things is great. Um, any systems we do put into place, make sure we've got the personnel. As opposed to making a system and then looking for the personnel, let's look at the, look at the personnel we have and design the system around that so it is doable. And then have that wish list of what we'd like to do, or have it be an expandable system, something we can easily ramp up as we get more people. Trust management. Again, one of the most important things we'll, we'll talk about here as far as shelter health, when you think of shelter health and, and you think of no-kill and whatnot, because yeah, tons of kitty cats get put down, two reasons. One, we're way too full, and indeed, they're all snotty and they look just terrible. Well, they'll get better. We all know they'll get better. Whether we educate them or not, you know, 99% of them would get better if we had the time and the space. But they're the first one to get put down and forcing when we have too many animals, and that does kind of make it easy and give us an outlet. Well, that'd be great if they're all perfectly healthy. We're not going to be able to turn to that. So as far as getting to a no-kill place, it's much better if you've got you know, 100 healthy cats looking at you as opposed to 70 or 30 that look like heck. You know, those are the first ones, but we don't want to jeopardize the rest of the population. The public doesn't like it, all this and that. So from, from a no-kill standpoint, let's keep these guys healthy. And, and again, we see it in the dogs too, although it's not as big of an issue, and kennel comp isn't quite as ugly. It sounds pretty ugly, but they don't look bad. We, I mean, you've all seen the cat where you can't see their eyeballs. The things are so swollen up. They can't breathe. They just they look terrible. Uh, so stress management in these guys is huge. Um, again, especially with the established residents, even though it's, it's a different goal from the incoming. The incoming, we got one set of stressors to worry about. Once we've got these established residents, um, they can be in our playrooms. We've got a little kitty city area where we can start to mix and match and give these guys some play time. We don't want to be changing animals out all the time, but uh, some animals love the group setting, other ones don't. And again, if we spend time watching them uh, from their body language, we'll know which ones belong in there. If you've got a room where you can put five to seven animals in, they're going to be healthier and happier and loving. Um, so the stress management thing for, for your established residents is very important. And again, we can lose that spending all our time on the incoming guys, what their set of circumstances are. So sometimes the established guy, well, it's doing okay, and we don't think about it. But if we really look and study their, their actions and movements, 
um, a, a cat that may not be all that healthy and happy in, in this cage or with one other group might really flourish in this kind of a setting and might get adopted a little bit quicker. So as far as increasing adoption, sometimes we can just do it with that, change the venue. A cat that would never get adopted in the cage alone because it has no personality because it's stressed out might get adopted in a heartbeat in a group type setting. Or if it's got, you know, some toys or something else, we can relieve its stress. Um, we can get it all in a little bit quicker. Sanitation, again, um, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail uh, down the road here, but for the established residents as well as the incoming area, um, this is just as important because a lot of these guys still can look pretty normal. And maybe we quarantined them for seven days, we're thinking, oh, it's a piece of cake. Well, they can still be shedding for to tell for three weeks. So again, it might not get the attention that it needs, and the next thing you know, we've had this, it's this run that you tend to think is, is the old timers, they're good, they're safe, all of a sudden six of the dogs are coughing and hacking, we've got to separate them, which requires movement, stress, animals out of the adoption light, money to take care of them. So all of that can come from us not paying attention to sanitation in the established areas, because it just kind of gets, you know, the, 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 the squeaky wheels get in the grease, and, and a lot of times our establish not belong. Um, the record's good. Make sure we keep doing that record, not just the incoming animals have a great record, then there's nothing written for 20 days. So we got to make sure that, again, there's something in place that we're jotting something down. Management of illness and getting these guys, that, that was all of those, those healthy animals and keeping them healthy. Um, the management of the illness and, and getting them back to health is what do we do with that. Um, and again, we've got the incoming animals, which is probably a little bit more of a challenge. I think we probably get more euthanasia coming from sick animals coming in. And again, it depends on time and space, degree of illness, money, all of that. Um, but I think I think we're challenged more with incoming ones than we are the established ones. The established ones, they've got our hearts, we already love them. Oh, this one's protected, don't put Fluffy down. Whereas if Fluffy just hit the door and looked like that, Fluffy would be down. So from a military standpoint, we probably need to spend a little bit more time managing illness and return to health and the incoming. And again, probably one of the most important things on there is going to be um, is going to be uh, the stress management. Yeah, it's, it's going to be huge, especially these incoming guys. So we have again with incoming animals that are sick as opposed to healthy. We've got our initial assessment: uh, is it treatable? Is it not treatable? Uh, and, and that's sorry about the typo. This is dog with treated from being another medical problem. Um, Again, the treatable versus non-treatable, it, it varies. It depends on space, it depends on money, it depends on the condition, the possibility of other animals in the shelter get, getting sick, um, the possibility of people getting sick. I mean, there's a lot of things broiled into that, so it's quite the double-edged sword. But if an animal comes in and it's got mange, we can probably treat it. If it's a good dog, if it looks adaptable, um, if it's not going to be undue, you know, we're not going to have him in inhumane conditions for a month while we're trying to treat him. Do we have the capability? Are we able to do the diagnostic test? Are we just going to keep guessing at what it has and trying to do hit and miss? Um, so is it treatable? Is it not treatable? If it's treatable, again, we need our records. We have to document how we're going to do it. We need to have a timeline for it. And we're going to have to document the progress and chart the progress and know. Um, are we going to vaccinate or not? Again, with uh, with this group that's not healthy, we've got to say, okay, benefits versus risk. And again, the sooner we can get a vaccine in them, the better. Um, vaccines are burdensome. Whether it's a modified live or kill, it's going to be another tax on that animal that might be at the breaking point right now. But again, we got to walk the fine line. Do we push it farther into illness? Do we try and protect it from additional things going on? And each vaccine will be, be different because uh, they're going to put a different burden on that animal. So again, we, we've got to kind of weigh the, the pluses and minuses. What type of animal? Are we talking about a young animal or is it an old animal? An older animal is sick? I'm not really going to worry about it. We've probably got some immunity going on. The young animal is sick? We don't know. It might not have any immunity. And we don't want to bring something in that's going to, again, cause a, cause a major illness or else the, uh, the hospital. Fourteen. <laughs> the dog can be really nice at times. <laughs> um, let's see, we've got, okay, again, the, the same thing. Um, when we're bringing in a sick animal, we've got to quarantine this animal. Um, we, we can do a behavior assessment on it and figure out what's going on, but at the very least, from a disease standpoint, we need to have it under our control and know what's going on. Whether it's a holding period for five days and then some serious behavior modification, 
Um, or are we going to start trying to treat it what's going on if it's not an aggression issue and it's just um, a health issue? Um, again, with, with, with quarantine, we're always wondering about the transmission potential. Is it something that's highly transmissible? Is it something that really isn't transmissible and much easier to, uh, to control? Because that's going to, you don't also have to have a, a five day for everything. Some things you can have mild, medium, you know, severe as far as how long to quarantine. So you can have a different room if you have that luxury. Um, sometimes staging things are good too, like the incoming animals get put in this room after two days and move into this room, which is kind of a transition, and then we can get them out into the main population. So you can break that up um, in, in, in lieu of this, or in light of this, this one is under our management of illness, um, not this picture exactly, but this, uh, this quarantine discussion. Um, for, for different stages, you're going to have some idea of shedding. How long are we going to be shedding certain things, and we can quarantine them based upon that and start to wean them out. Transmission potential. So this guy's obviously going to be very high, and, and we're going to have to keep him quiet and not stress, and hopefully have a place for him. Um, this cage probably not ideal. We're open all the way around, so he can sneeze. It's not all around. Um, and when you're talking transmission, again, dogs and cats are, are going to vary. The dogs are talking about a 15, 20 foot physical barrier because of the force of their sneezes and droplets, uh, how far they can carry. With cats, they're talking about five, six feet. So you don't need as much physical separation. In for them. Um, again, you don't want them right next to Some people say, well, we should put the cats next to the dogs because they don't really catch the same thing. No, the dog can bark his head off, the cat's going to be stressed, and, and you're further behind. So we're all try trying to find some place good for these guys that are highly tra transmissible um, is the way to go.